Let's begin with a prayer. God of our hope and abundant love, open our hearts and minds to your word in scripture this morning so that we might find our way forward from dark places, from confusing events and difficult challenges in our world, in our nation, and in our lives. Lord God, we pray for understanding. We pray for direction. Dare we settle down despite our fears and trust in you. Are you with us, God? Or are we all alone? Send us your prophetic word and give us ears to hear. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. The year is 590 BCE. The place, Judea. Geopolitically, the region is rife with conflict. In its biggest city, Jerusalem, all hell is about to break loose. The Babylonians are invading, led by the conquering king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is now stretching his empire all the way from his home in Babylon, modern-day Iraq, to the border region of his arch-rival Egypt, invading and conquering the buffer states of Assyria and Palestine in the process. The Babylonian army has just cut across the desert land that is modern-day Syria, across the northeastern region of the Israelite land that we know as the Golan Heights. The Babylonians are closing in on Jerusalem now. The Hebrew people, God's covenant people, are under siege. Not far away, in Anathoth, still in Judea, our prophet Jeremiah's hometown, people are running for the hills. Jeremiah has been forecasting the invasion for months. He's been broadcasting God's plans of destruction for God's wayward people. It's been all bad news all the time. Jeremiah has proclaimed from the public square, from the palace of Jerusalem, in a loud and publicly annoying way, the future fall of Judea and the capture of its puppet king, Zedekiah. He declares that the Babylonians will destroy the city and drag Zedekiah into Babylonian exile. If you fight against the Babylonians, Jeremiah informs the king, you will not succeed. Zedekiah is furious. He wants encouragement from God's prophet, not a prediction of failure. He equates Jeremiah's message to treason. But he has to be careful, because Jeremiah has been right so far. He wants him close at hand. He wants him alive. So the king places Jeremiah under house arrest in Jerusalem and accuses him of being a traitor. For Jeremiah, the reluctant prophet, the bearer of bad news, the man who wants his faithless people to change their ways, the situation has gone from bad to worse, from grim to dire, from discouragement to despair. The Babylonians are marching in. God tells Jeremiah that the people must surrender. But Jeremiah has been silenced. He languishes. He waits. The year is 2016. The place is anywhere on our planet. Geopolitically, the world is ripe with conflict. In Israel, there is fighting and mistrust between the Jews and Palestines, with violent flare-ups and constant threats from the same nations that threatened the region in Jeremiah's day. In Syria, the city Aleppo has been bombed to rubble. Syrian war refugees flee for safety as far as our own shores. The civilians who remain live under a constant state of siege. In America, violence is on the rise. Shoppers at a mall north of Seattle are killed at a cosmetics counter. 
by a 20-year-old gunman armed with a rifle. Controversy plagues police departments nationwide over excessive use of force and racial profiling and a string of police shootings. In Tulsa, a charge of manslaughter against an officer who fatally shot, he shot an unarmed black motorist, Terrence Crutcher. In Charlotte, four nights of angry protests after another black man, Keith Lamont Scott, is shot and killed by police there. <coughs> Street marches, curfews, a state of emergency. Last weekend, in New York City, a terror attack by a graduate of Edison High School, a neighbor, a radicalized Afghani extremist, he set four homemade kettle bombs to explode in Chelsea and at the Jersey Shore to terrorize, to kill, to maim. Good police sleuthing and the unwitting help of two homeless men thwart the loss of life. But one bomb goes off and innocent people are severely injured. Everywhere, people are asking, what is the world coming to? Just then, just when Jeremiah thought nothing could get any worse, God speaks to him once more. God tells him what he must do. By land, by land, God says. By land in the war-ravaged country that is bleeding all around you. By the land that your cousin will come to offer you. Land owned by your uncle, family land. You have the right to buy it. You must redeem it, bail out your uncle so he can flee. Immediately, Jeremiah's cousin arrives at his doorstep. The cousin has some land to sell. Jeremiah's ears are ringing. The cousin asks Jeremiah to buy his uncle's land holding in Anathoth. The Babylonians were probably marching through it as they spoke. Jeremiah knew what he must do. The request to buy the land was word for word what the Lord had required of him. He would have to comply. Even from his place of confinement, he would purchase the land, a battlefield in his hometown, his field of dreams, his hope for tomorrow. Jeremiah called together witnesses, court officials, and his own personal secretary, a scrivener named Baruch, to assist with the sale. Paid for the land with 17 shekels of silver. He signed and sealed the deed. He weighed out the silver in front of witnesses. He had them countersign the documents. He was careful the transfer of title was done right. All this while held in confinement. All this with the Babylonians marching to war with his nation. All this with an abiding faith in God. For Jeremiah knew something that the others did not. Jeremiah knew God's plan for God's people. Within the hearing of all the other witnesses and court officials who had come to assist with this insane land deal, this long-term investment strategy to purchase war-ravaged land, Jeremiah spoke to Baruch saying, before the invaders come, before chaos erupts, before our city is destroyed, do this thing that the Lord has asked of us. Take these documents and put them in a clay jar so they will last for a long time. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says, houses, fields, and vineyards will once again be bought in this land. God has given God's people one final gift. One last chance, God gave them hope for the future, hope for a new generation, hope that one day, someday, a long time away, the land will be fruitful again, the people will return, a time of resurrection will come. 650 years later, a man named Paul would remind the members of this fledgling church in Corinth that we all have this treasure in clay jars. 
In Paul's day and in ours, those clay jars represent our bodies in Christ. And the treasure is inside us. The treasure inside us is the promised future that Christ brings. For Jeremiah and Baruch, it was a promise of redemption, a land deal as a symbol of hope. The deed held in an earthen jar was God's promise for a peaceful future. The deed to Anathoth was a bet that the future would be bright despite the current chaos of the day. The Babylonian military invasion would result in disaster for the Hebrew people. Seventy years in exile, most people taken as prisoners to the Babylonian lands. The temple in Jerusalem would be demolished, but Jeremiah would survive. He would remain behind in Jerusalem, where Jeremiah modeled his faith. He trusted in God's promise. He invested in the future, waiting for better days ahead. And they came. Today, in America, we read about and experience firsthand our own troubled times. Today, in Charlotte, people are on edge, but they are looking for a way forward. Today, in Tulsa, people are on edge, but they are looking for justice. In every part of our globe, there are conflicts and there are problems, but there is hope for the future, even as we lament the troubles of our present day. In recent speeches at the United Nations, in magazine articles and newspapers, we can read about the irony of our present day lives, that our world is safer, healthier and wealthier than ever before, that the percentage of people living in poverty worldwide is lower than it has ever been, that technological advancement and medical developments guarantee longer and healthier lifetimes for more people than for any previous generation. But the inequalities continue. The poverty remains. The illnesses and the exclusions and the overlooked exist alongside and within our gleaming, prosperous world. And that is the reason why Christ continues to call us, why we continue to serve as vessels, clay jars, holding the treasure of a lifetime. The spark of spirit is what ignites our faith in Christ that guides our moral thinking and our commitment to making the world a better place. Christ calls us to commit, to commit ourselves to helping the widow and the orphan, the lonely and the despairing, the imprisoned and the hungry, the people of every race and religion. God calls us to love our neighbor and to look for the light of hope in every human being, to never stop trying, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And this is why we gather in faith, why we baptize our little ones, why we teach the good news of the gospel and reach out to our neighbors in love. For every time we pour the waters of baptism over a child or an adult, we remember who we are. We are Christians, each one of us, called to live lives that participate in Christ's mission wherever we may find ourselves, whether it be in Metuchen or in Edison or in New York City, in Charlotte or Seattle or in Tulsa, in Syria or in Indonesia or in Jerusalem. We are called to hold God's treasure inside fragile clay jars we carry the treasure of God's love for others within our very tender hearts. In Christ, we can be confident by faith. With God's help and our dedicated efforts, we can make a difference. We can reconcile. We can treat mental illness. We can model neighbor love. We can broker peace. We can heal the hurting. And one day, one person, one conflict at a time, we will succeed. And that is why we pray over our little ones, over the newly baptized Sophia, 
and the newly baptized Kai. And we pray that over each one of us who takes on the fresh, clean raiment of Christ at the baptismal font, we pray that the Holy Spirit fill them with the grace and hope of Jesus Christ, that they would live out their lives filled with the Spirit, with the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and the Spirit of joy in God's presence, now and forever. Amen.